Up next is Nico Meissensal, Senior Cloud and DevOps Consultant from White Duck, talking about how to hijack a Kubernetes cluster based on common attack vectors, make you aware about these attacks, and how to prevent them. Hi, everyone, and welcome to my talk, uh, Hijack a Kubernetes Cluster. So my name is Nico Meisenzahl. I'm a senior cloud and DevOps consultant at White Duck, uh, based in Germany. Um, I'm doing stuff around containers, Kubernetes, and, and Cloud Native, and I'm a Microsoft MVP as well as um, GitLab Hero. So uh, today's talk is about container security, Kubernetes security, but it's not really a, a deep dive security talk. It's more to make you aware of common attack vendors as well as showing you how to prevent them using best practices. So basically, um, giving you everything you need to know to run a secure Kubernetes cluster, use common best practices, and also to show you um, what can happen if you do not implement those best practices. So first uh, one, we will do some high checking on the Kubernetes cluster. Um, I will show you some details in the sec. Um, which we do, um, which I will do um, with a demo. And then after each step talking about how you can prevent those using common best practices. So this is mainly interactive talk. Um, so we will have one more slide uh, showing you what we will hijack. Um, and you can also follow up if you would like to um, using this Git, uh, GitHub repo, you will find all the details and everything um, in here. Also, how to set up your own uh, environment to um, yeah, do the demo on your own. Okay, so what we will do, and let me enable the laser here. Uh, so we are the person here on the left, um, and we were um, using a web-based application called Ping Me application. So this application is basically just a web-based uh, application written in Golang, um, which allows you to put an IP address into an input field, um, push a button and then you will get um, the output of the ping. So pretty simple. And uh, we will use this um, application to inject some code, which gets executed in our uh, ping me pod or ping me container in our Kubernetes cluster. So this one will be the first step. From there, um, we will open up a, a reverse shell um, onto an attacker machine. So basically the attacker machine is just a Linux virtual machine running in the cloud with a public IP address, allowing us to uh, connect with the reverse shell. And then we will use this attacker machine for all other um, attacks we will do. So first one is we're trying to talk into the API server and trying to schedule some workload into the Kubernetes cluster. Then we will try to hijack um, the Kubernetes node um, so see if you can schedule something in there, if you can get some, some details from our uh, node where our uh, container is running on and stuff like this. And then we will get even further and we will try to hijack also the whole cloud or our cloud account and try to get access to other cloud resources in our account. Um, so this will be um, the last one. But starting with the ping me application. So here you're seeing um, the application. As I said, pretty pretty easy one, simple one. It's just a ping me application, and we have the possibility here to put in an IP address, um, push the go button, and we are now seeing um, our command. So we're doing a ping on our local address here, and we're getting the output. And as we see here, this looks pretty um, yeah normal. So looks like this is not any kind of self-implemented ping or so, looks like this is just really um, in the shell, the ping command and the output we are getting here. So let's see if we can um, inject something here. So let's see, it looks like it's somehow shell related. So let's try a semicolon here and let's try an echo I was here. So we are having our IP address, we're having a semicolon, try to inject the second command and doing an echo. So let's say, let's see if this works. Pushing the go button. Once again, we're getting our command here. And we're also getting our ping output, um, like in the first example, but we also at the end, we're getting an I was here. Um, so pretty nice. We were able to inject a command um, using this semicolon here. Uh, but besides injecting an echo, we didn't, and it did not did anything further. So let's try something else. 
Um, so starting again with semicolon and doing an, an, an which and see if the bash is available. So basically see if in the container we have a bash available as in shell. Um, and this also looks good. And um, we also skipped the IP address because we know we can inject something. So we're just starting with a semicolon, um, which bash, and we're seeing we have an output here, um, which is slash bin slash bash. So we have basically a bash available, um, which we in the second step can use to spin up a reverse shell. Um, so first one, we were able to somehow inject into the container uh, because of yeah, unsecure code. Um, and other stuff, but let's um, go um, to more details. Um, to sum up, we first injected or just typed in our IP address. We then tried to inject an echo here and then tried if we have a bash available. So first of all, how can we uh, prevent this one? First of all, shift security left, which does that mean? So. Um, we were able to check the code because um, the code wasn't written securely. Um, so normally um, you should find such kinds of issues either in pair programming or in the code review process when reviewing your merge request or last one using um, yeah, code scanning like uh, static code analysis or others, which could have also been executed in your pull request before really uh, building your application, deploying your application somewhere. Uh, so first of all, basically shift security left to not deploy unsecure code like this one in any running environment, really important. So second one is build smaller or build smaller and secure images. So in our case, we were able to uh, echo something we were able to use or at least find the bash. So why do we need a bash in this um, container image at all? So as I said, it's a Golang um, based application. So basically just the binary, the Golang binary would have been enough um, to run this application if it's implemented correctly. Um, so we wouldn't need bash here. We wouldn't need echo here. Um, could be everything or could be removed from the image would make a more secure, smaller image and wouldn't allow us to um, yeah, inject code in this example. Okay, but now we did not inject anything except an echo. So let's see if we can um, open up a reverse shell um, to this container. So for this, we need two steps. First step is we need to open up a um, command um, on our attacker host. Well, the attacker host, the virtual machine, uh, we are running somewhere in the cloud, which has a public endpoint. Um, I already connected via SSH here, and now just using netcat and open up a port on port 80. Um, we have chosen port 80 here because basically now the container will connect to this port and why not using 80? Um, it's pretty common, or at least in some environment, it's common to open up 80, 443, uh, as an outgoing connection. So we're just using Eddy here instead of doing any, any high pod stuff or so. So then we also need to check some code in our container to really open up or connect the reverse shell to our attacker machine. Here, first of all, we are once again, starting with a semicolon. Um, we're saying, hey, bash, and this is why we tested if bash is available. So it's one option. There are other options, but this one is the easy one, easiest one. Uh, we are spinning up a bash. And in this bash, we are spinning up another bash and redirecting the whole bash output to our attacker machine, port 80. So if we do so, I'm hitting go, um, the patch starts loading, loading, loading. But if I go back to, um, to my attacker machine, we are now seeing root at sample app, some kind of um, things here. So we are now, we have now a bash running in our container. So we see the Docker file, we're seeing um, our Golang binary. We are also seeing here um, our code, our main, main.go. We can just have a look into here. And basically this is the line which caused the whole trouble here. We're doing an exec uh, within, hey, I would like to uh, execute a shell. 
and provide a command. And here we're doing a ping and also adding any kind of input here. And so basically this is the root cause. Um, if this, this line would have been found by any static code analyzing tool, um, basically also when you do a pair querying or reviewing your code, um, somebody on an senior developer should have found this easily. Um, and with, without this line, basically everything which we're now doing now wouldn't happen at all. So shift security left is, is pretty important. But hey, we are now in this container um, and can do some stuff from here. But before we go um, any further, let's see how we could prevent this one. And we have plenty of options here. So first, again, um, run secure images. Once again, without a bash, we wouldn't be able, um, or so easily able um, to spin up a reverse shell. Um, second one is implement network policies. So really decide where a container process should be able to connect to. In our example, we were able to open up a reverse shell because the container is able to speak to the internet, to any IP address, to any port. Um, so really implement network policies and decide where a container is able to talk to. And not only for outgoing communications, of course, also for outgoing com communications, but also for communications within the cluster from one application to another application, from one application to another namespace, or maybe in your internal network from a container running in a cluster to an um, internal database um, or anything else. So really, really important. So use network policies. There are plenty of implementations and secure your whole network um, connections in your cluster. So furthermore, um, there are tools which allows you to secure your container runtime. Um, so tools like, for example, Falco, allow you to detect and also deny um, further processes in your container. So basically Falco would be able to detect that there was a second process, the bash process started in the container, could have sent some alertings, could have also killed this process um, to make sure that only the main process is running in the container. Um, also pretty important. So if there was an injection in the container, you could have used Falco to detect it and also to prevent it. But also in this case, we do not have Falco in place. Um, so we are now attached to a container in a Kubernetes cluster and nobody knows about it. So um, next thing we are doing. So let's see if we can get access to the Kubernetes API here. So first of all, uh, we need to get our token. Um, the token is stored, and this is also just plain or default Kubernetes stuff, is uh, exposed in the container in this URL. Um, same the certificate. So we just need to export those into um, variables that we can use it. And now we can use curl and see if we can talk to the Kubernetes API. So what are we doing here? We're doing a curl, we're providing the certificate and we are providing a, a header, an authorization header with a bearer token. Well, the token is the file we exposed here, this in cat. And then we're saying, hey, I would like to do a get on the Kubernetes service host, which is also a default environment variable and the Kubernetes service port, um, which is also a default environment variable slash API. So basically we have everything in place in the container to talk to our API here. And it looks like we at least get some kind of um, response here and it's not a deny. So it looks like we have some kind of, um, yeah, of, of roles or role bindings to be able to talk um, to the Kubernetes API. So let's see, um, get a step further if we can get access to some workload here. So first of all, we're trying to get access to workload in our namespace. So we also exporting our current namespace, which is also exposed um, by Kubernetes or, or mounted by Kubernetes in our container runtime and doing a pretty similar call command. 
um, and just, just uh, changing the context here. So instead of going to slash API, we're going to slash API. We want namespaces, then our namespace and pods. And now let's see if we get access um, to pods here. And we're getting some feedback. Um, so we somehow have here a running container. So let's draw a bit up. Um, getting many, many informations here. And it looks like we have um, our um, we have a container here. We have running of the namespace default, um, getting all of the details here. So we somehow have at least read access um, to the Kubernetes API, which is pretty nice. But doing it with Perl, it's not so easy, not so nice. So let's see if we have internet access also to download um, kubectl. So why not? We were able to spin up a reverse shell, so maybe we also can just install uh, kubectl from GitHub. Looks good. Um, so we can now use kubectl to get pods and see if we can see something. And here we go. So basically we're seeing a pod and it looks like this is the pod we are connected to. Um, so let's see if we also um, see pods in all other namespaces. Okay, this does not work. So it looks like it's forbidden for our user. Um, user is the service account in the default namespace and we are running as a default uh, service account. Pretty interesting here. Um, so let's see if we can um, get access or get details of the nodes. Okay, also nodes are um, forbidden. So it looks like we are able to um, read pods. So let's see if we also can create pods. And there we can also use kubectl for um, kubectl authentication. Can I create pod? And we're getting a yes. So we are also able to create pods. Um, pretty interesting. So maybe it's something we will do just in a sec. So, but first of all, um, let's sum up how to prevent this one. So basically we were able to talk to the Kubernetes API. Um, normal behavior would be that we get an access denied because on service account without any privileges or default service account does not have any access to the Kubernetes API. But um, in case of your sharing service accounts, are you deploying any third party applications and you do not review the deployment files? You're just copying some, some snippets somewhere from, from GitHub or other locations and just um, deploy them with kubectl apply to your cluster. You will lead up with having uh, privileged service accounts, you might have role bindings which you are not aware of. So it's something I see pretty often in at customer sites. So basically you have role bindings and privileged service accounts in your cluster without knowing it. And in our case here, it's the default service account in the default namespace. So maybe somebody installed some kind of application three years ago, two years ago. Um, this deployment includes role binding this small button get, get deleted afterwards and we are now having a default account which is able to create pods to read pox uh, and nobody is aware of it. So really make sure to not share service accounts between applications. So really create your own service accounts instead of using the default one. Um, if you have higher privileged service accounts which need access to the Kubernetes API, make really, really sure um, to use separated accounts and also to make sure that you do not have anything left over if you delete um, the used application. It's really, really important. Um, also, if you have any kind of third party snippets, really read over them, see what they are doing. Do they include role bindings? Do they include roles, cluster roles, cluster role bindings? And really understand what those are doing before applying them to your Kubernetes cluster. Um, but furthermore, also read only file systems um, in the container runtime could have helped. So we are now easily um, able to install kubectl. Um, if this would have been a container with just a read only file system, this would be even harder. Um, so it would be also an option if it's possible for your workload. And of course, things we already talked about, like 
limit egress traffic. Without that one, we wouldn't be able to install kubectl, um, use the QR container images. Without curl, we wouldn't be easily to so easily talk to the uh, Kubernetes API. And once again, detect untrusted processes um, with Falco or, or similar tools. So um, now, as you saw, we are able to create an, an, an pod in our cluster. So let's see if we can deploy a privileged pod and also mount some, um, some resources from our node. So what we are doing here now is we are scheduling a so-called privileged pod. This is just the name. But um, we also setting the privileged true security context here, which allows or which gives the pods more, more access on the, on the local machine. And also we are trying to mount a host pass and mount the run container D pass here to maybe be later able to talk to container D directly. So just copy pasting this one here. We are having kubectl, so it's pretty easy. Um, it's a pod created. Um, so we can now again do a kubectl get pod. Um, it's still creating here, but it should be here in just a sec. And we're now using kubectl access and just open up a bash um, in this privileged container here. So looks good. So if we're now doing LS, we are now in the container, um, which has privileged access, first of all, and which has run container D mounted to slash mount um, in, this, in this container or in this pod. So to have a pretty easy life here, we're installing some tools because we know we have internet access or so just doing an app get update and installing curl and uh, jQuery here, jQuery here. Um, just, we wouldn't need it, but hey, we have internet access, so why not? And because we would like to talk to container D, we are also um, downloading the latest container D um, CLI from GitHub. Uh, but this worked. And we are now able, um, because of the mount, and be able to download um, the container D CLI, we should be now able, by providing um, the address to the socket from container D, which is in the container um, on the mount point slash mount container D socket, we would like to see all containers in the namespace Kubernetes and doing a container list here. And we're now seeing all containers um, running on this machine. So we basically now, as you saw with kubectl, we just saw one pod. We are here now seeing all containers running on this node, um, even if we do not, even without access to um, yeah, via Kubernetes directly with container D. So from here, we can now start over, get access to other applications, create own containers, and, and other stuff. So, but before we do this one, once again, um, talk about how to prevent this one. Um, also in Kubernetes, it's possible to deploy or define policies. For example, to not run root containers, to not be able to um, run privileged containers, to not be able to mount host pass volumes and stuff like this. Um, and there, many tools or multiple tools which can help you to implement policies. One is Open Policy Agent Gatekeeper, so OPA Gatekeeper. The other one is Kiverno, um, but there are also others. And those help you to really decide and implement policies. So we can really say, okay, I would like to run pods with this setting. And there are many, many um, default policies which you can apply pretty easily to really make sure that you yeah, fix all common issues to have really a um, secure environment um, within your Kubernetes cluster. Um, this include, as I said, privileged containers, host paths in our case, um, root containers, which we also used uh, to really make sure that you aren't able to expose like, like we did. Yeah, and of course, things we already talked about, um, sharing service accounts, limit ecos traffic, and all the other things we already, already talked about. 
So, but let's see if we now can, um, yeah, get access to um, even more data here. Uh, what we are doing now um, is we're trying to get access um, to another container, which is not running. Um, okay, it looked like it's got a small issue here, but let's fix that one pretty fast. Um, so we're getting here IP, an ID from one of the running instances. So just grabbing one here. Uh, let's say this one. Um, we are we, we are grabbing for the image here, and then try to get um, the ID of that one. Okay, and we now had an issue and lost our connection. So one sec, this is sometimes a timeout. Um, timeout in the reverse shell, but isn't that bad. Um, so we also need again to connect to privileged host. So, and here we are back. So anyway, if you're just doing and, and list again here. And we are now um, using this command and just any ID doesn't matter for now. Um, one sec. I need to copy that one here. So. Basically, we are now talking to container D again, providing the address saying, hey, the namespace container info and providing an uh, ID here. And just enter that one. And we once again are not connected anymore to To the machine anymore. So it's live and we have some kind of issues here. Um, so let's see. Uh, and we now again need to get access to the privilege pod and doing a list again. So it looks good now. And we're now doing an info, what we talked about. And then doing a check query here. And check query specs, now it's working. So we're doing um, container D CLI on the address getting the container info of a specific container, which we do not see with Kubernetes, and then query here for the process environment. And this example, um, because we had an issue up front, do not use um, the right one. Um, oh, I did. We're now seeing here a DB string and seeing here a really secret DB connection string. So basically we are now seeing the environment variables which are exposed to the container runtime which is the best practice to check secrets, configurations and stuff like this um, using environment variables. And with this now we are easily able to get this secret string, talk to the database, extract the data, delete data and stuff like this. So without being, um, yeah, without um, needing any further secrets or the one. Okay. Um, so um, once again, how to prevent this one? Um, same things like, like before. So really make sure to limit um, the things somebody can schedule in Kubernetes. Like I said, host pass allowed us to talk to container D. Uh, privileged containers also allowed us to get access to the node here to extract the secret and, and other things. So really make sure 
um, that you have um, policies in place. Um, but we have many, any further options here. So we could also get one step further. We are now still in the Kubernetes cluster. We are on the node. We have access to all containers in the node, but we could also get a step further and get access to other cloud resources or also create other cloud resources. So for this, um, we are just mounting the whole disk from our node. In this case, we're just grabbing for the first disk, for the first dev SDA and mounting it to 10. Um, and from there, um, there's a file called attempt ECD Kubernetes Azure JSON. And this is it's an Azure example, but it also works on other um, or other uh, big cloud providers at least, um, where they store some kind of cloud information to talk between Kubernetes and the cloud environment and stuff like this. And we will use this one um, to grab the identity, um, the underlying identity. Um, and if we now check here, we can do an echo on this one. We get the identity back. This is the ID of the identity um, of the Kubernetes cluster, in this case on Azure. And we can also get a step further here and also request a token. So here we're requesting a token. We're using curl talking to the Azure metadata service. Although this is in this case, Azure specific, but it also works on all other cloud providers and saying, hey, we would like to get an OS2 token for our cloud ID, providing our cloud ID, providing some more information, doesn't matter here. And then, um, yeah, running a check query for the access token response. So if we now do an echo on this one, um, we get a valid um, or zero token. And now with this token, and this identity, we could go to Azure, talk to Azure, see if this identity has access to any other cloud resources, is able to create other cloud resources, or maybe you are able to spin up a virtual machine, mine some bitcoins or anything else. And this is not running the Kubernetes cluster, it's only running on your cloud account and it's not anymore connected with Kubernetes. So um, once again, how to prevent this one? Um, very, very important, deny the access to the metadata service um, for cloud providers if you don't need it. Uh, so if you don't need it, there are use cases where you might need the uh, metadata service, then you might allow it in certain namespaces or for certain workload, but in general, deny it using network policies to be not able to gain any access outside of Kubernetes. Um, really, really important. And with that of this, once again, no privileged container, implement network policies, implement Kubernetes policies, and all the other things um, we talked about. So um, yeah, with this, I would like to end up my talk. Um, yeah, you will find the slides on SlideShare. You will find the whole demo and the whole code on my GitHub project. Um, and yeah, ping me if you have any questions. Thanks. Thanks to Microsoft Azure and Equinix Metal for supporting us at the champion level. We also want to thank Red Hat and Slim.ai for funding us at our supporter level.